So hey guys, we are recording. Please check whether you see the recording button pop up. Second thing, this Ansible example exercise we did is available in my Macintosh. And what I intend to do is to not use the Macintosh, but instead go to that virtual machine and in there use the virtual machine itself. So here is that VM starting up and I will play that exercise right inside the VM so that we don't confuse anybody and give a consistent experience so everybody can be on the same page even if you don't have a Macintosh handy. So that's not a concern. Now while the machine boots up, I will like to prepare a computer on the cloud. So we'll go say, hey, hey, can you give me a machine out there in Seattle? And we will select, you know, we can choose any operating system we like, but you know, as you know, the differences between Ubuntu and Debian, at least in this cloud, is that this cloud Debian doesn't give you pseudo package. Pseudo package is missing. So that's okay, we understand that. But still we are taking Debian because we have modified our exercise already and the GitHub uh, link that you now have should already tell you that it has been updated to include the play to install pseudo package right there. So that package will be installed even on any, any OS, whether they have it or not. And as, as a consequence, you will find that this thing should work in Debian as well as Ubuntu. So that is the exercise I want to begin doing again quickly, which requires me to first thing, post that link in Slack chat. And then uh, we will uh, clone that link directly in our VM. So here is the VM. And in there, I will uh, see if that repository is already available. Uh, yes, it is. So I will pull it. I think pull may not work because my keys are not in uh, GitHub. So pull may not work. So I'll basically delete that repository. Oh, sorry. I'll delete that Ansible repository, Ansible example, and then clone. The clone should work with this link. And so it will clone that thing. It will become available in my computer and we'll open up in Atom Editor. So we'll see it right inside the VM. And in there, uh, the, the host file is written a little bit differently this time so that it becomes easy for us to really understand and identify the parameters involved here. The first parameter we have to provide is to give them an IP address to this machine that I want to configure, make it a little bit harder than it is given to us by default. The goal of this exercise is to manage credentials, make sure that nobody can log on to the box directly using root logins. By default, many clouds actually give you machines like this with a root login. And some of them even give you the root password, which is kind of insecure as a, as a good practice. It is not considered to be a good practice. So that's what I want to make sure is that this root user is eliminated. It exists by the way. So on the console, if you happen to visit the building where this machine actually is and you physically touch the machine right there on the console of the machine, that location root user will continue to work. No issues. It's only the SSH that we want to prevent SSH root logins, SSH password-based logins. We want to strictly enforce some other user like this, for example. And only with SSH-based, key-based authentication. That is what I want to discipline everybody in, in, at all, all our machines and make sure that this user gets created and that is able to log in using this public, so this private key and root logins through SSH are disabled. Now again, clarification. If you go to the machine physically and you connect to it, you will still be able to log in through root. That is okay and understood. So with these setups in place, we need to make sure that this key is provided. So I will make sure that this key is used in DigitalOcean, whatever that cloud is. It's called Vulture Cloud. So I need to give them that key pair that I have, which I need to grab from here. So I'll say cat, uh, do I have a public key right there? I do. So I'll grab this public key and give it to that Vulture Cloud. So we'll copy that public key right there. Give it to the Vulture Cloud at the time of creation of this machine. We are selecting Debian and we are selecting to use this new key uh, that I will provide. This is called the Cloud Genius ID underscore RSA and pasting the key itself, add the key. That's the key I want to use. And then Select in Seattle, Debian, $10 machine, and this Cloud Genius ID RSA workstation key from the workstation, and then give it a name. This machine I want to call Ansible example. This name is irrelevant. 
absolutely no relevance to whatever that's this name that you can choose whatever you like. So we'll with that I deploy. Then I get an IP address. I will use that IP address from here into this location. And I will talk about this host file that I have written differently. Previously, the last time we discussed this, this host file was in one long line. It was kind of hard to read on a, on a small screen. That's why I have converted the format of this host file reference that you see here in Ansible CFG. Host file is the hosts file called hosts. That file is now written in YAML format. The other format that was there before is called the ini format, whereas this format is called the YAML format. The two formats, both are supported in Ansible, but this format is good for readability. And also, you know, just very succinctly under, helps you understand what is exactly you're dealing with. So that's another way to write Ansible host file inventory of all the machines that you are dealing with. And that is what we are you're going to use this time is the YAML representation of hosts. There's only one host, the host I am labeling at Ansible example. That is again, just a name that IP address is now available to us. So we'll grab it from here and go to this location. <clears throat> like that, save it. And now we'll test whether we can actually establish a connection directly. So we'll say SSH root at IP address. Can we connect? And it will automatically use the public private key combination that we have and it got connected and all that good stuff. It gets connected because in the remote machine, we have a file here that is called the authorized keys file. If you cat it, it contains exactly the same key that we have in our local computer idrsa.pub, that key matches. You can see that it actually does match item by item all the way here. You can see the matching patterns. It is the same public key that we dumped into that cloud company that put itself in this file called authorized keys file. And that is why we are able to log into this machine as the root user. Now imagine if I remove the key, temporarily place it in a different location. For example, this folder I have, sorry, this folder that I have, the .ssh folder, which is the default place to keep our keys. And imagine now if I move this key from here to some other location. So I'm gonna deliberately move it away. Like MV IDRSA to the home location. And MV IDRSA.pub to the home location. And then I will also SSH add and delete all my keys in the keychain that I carry. All identities removed with this understood. I will now go back to the Ansible example folder and attempt to connect to that remote computer. And this time I don't have my key in the right location and my SSH add key ring is also missing any identities. So this time if I attempt to connect to the machine using root login, what do you think will happen? Is that it will ask you for a password and it is asking me for a password. Now if you go to that cloud company and ask what password did you set? They actually give you that password right there. You can copy the password right from that location if you like, which I think we need to because that's the only way right now because we have disabled our own key based access. So we have moved them away from the expected folder and we have removed our identities from our keychain. So this SSH command does not know where the private key is. So therefore, it is attempting to log in using a password. Now, I think I have talked too much on the prompt and I've been waiting on the prompt, so it might fail on us because it might have timed out, but I'll still try, I'll give it the password. And it seems to succeed, which is nice. Sometimes, sometimes if I talk too much at this prompt and don't type the password quickly enough, the command itself might time out and therefore it might not succeed, but it will succeed in the second attempt. So it succeeded and we were able to Attempt, we were able to connect to this box using the root login and a password that we know from the cloud company. Some cloud companies don't give you the password. And this is also considered insecure if you are allowing password-based access in general. If you're allowing root access even with a key is also considered insecure, not a good practice. That is the reason why we are doing this hardening exercise at that location, which is the Ansible example that we are dealing with. Now, with this understood as the background, what I want to now do is run the play. So I can run the play from my local computer. So I exit from here 
and I want to run the play correctly exactly like is described in this location, which is where I have the readme file. And it says you clone the repository, go to that folder, and then the first run of Ansible, when you're running it first time on this machine, the root user, you want to keep it as root user in the host file. Because first time, this user is actually root. But in the subsequent attempts, you know that this YAML file will modify that user to create another user called root. And then at, at steps below, it will actually disable root access. So that's what is expected to happen. So in subsequent runs, as described in the readme file, subsequent Ansible runs, we would like to make sure that the root user is replaced by the Cloud Genius newly created user. And then it should continue to work with subsequent runs with the newly established user in place. I hope this is clear. This is the part that was confusing a little bit. So right now it is root, but we will come back after the first run to make it Cloud Genius. And then subsequent runs will also succeed and literally do nothing at that time because everything is already done in the first run. So now we are ready to run. We are back into our workstation. And here I want to run the play. How do you run the play in a playbook? You just say Ansible playbook. And then give the name of the play. The play describes what to do. It says, go to this machine called Ansible example. It is defined in the host file, which is this file here. And we can split on the right side and see what it says. So that's the machine that will go and target using the root login, this private key file that is not in the right spot, by the way. As you know, I moved it in the previous step. So I want to put that back in the right spot. If I don't have the key in the right location, this Ansible run will fail. Here's how it fails. It'll say key not found, permission denied, because the key is not in the right location. Key is sitting somewhere else. So either I can change this location to say that I know where the key is actually, not in that folder. So I can go like this and say cut, and then Ansible will suddenly start to work. You can see that it will actually work. But as a, as a better idea, what I have is to not change the, the host definition like that, but instead move the key right in the right spot, which is expected to be in that .ssh folder. So I will do that piece. I will move my key pair I have here in the home location where I have the keys. I would like to move them to the SSH location and also move the public key into the same expected location. So these are in the right spot now. I would like to make sure as a, as a double uh, confirmation that this SSH add actually adds my key in the keychain. So I will say, please add my key in the keychain. And now I will say SSH add to list out all the keys I have. And it tells me that it has the key, this particular file sitting in my keychain. So now I know that I can use the keychain. Sometimes on some computers, some, sometimes it occasionally happens is that this particular process that runs your keychain dies. And it has happened to a couple of, I think one of you at least. I think John was running into this at some point. The keychain dies and it's not able to evaluate your keys like that. So if that happens occasionally, which might happen out of the blue, so if that happens and the process that runs the keychain itself dies, you need to evaluate SSH agent. How do you do that? You go like this. And this generates another PID, which will now become the holder of your keys, which is where this key has no identities because I actually generated a new PID. This new process ID doesn't contain any keys in the keychain. So I will like to add my key one more time. And now it does contain the key. So this is the key uh, that I am now holding in my keychain. And I was able to re-evaluate the SSH agent, which generates a new process ID for the same agent. So it basically research the old identity, creates a, a new process for this to manage keys for me in the command line and now it has no identities. So I add the key again one more time, and now I have the key in the right spot. Now, SSH will be able to function just like that, SSH, root at whatever I'm typing in the, in the previous command, whatever that IP address was, that should succeed. And I connected, I come out of that, 
and now even ansible will succeed by the way because our our private key file is in the right location so now i think i heard a question there some 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 movement uh, of keyboard or something that yeah there yeah. there would be uh, would back ticks work here instead of dollar sign evaluate uh, in instead of this expression another yeah. way to write the same thing another way to write the same thing is a back tick like that and this also does the same thing now by the way by doing that i have evaluated another process id which is different so now i need to ssh add the key one more time and now i can evaluate and list out my my keys in the key ring a key chain and that's the key so now i am ready again so two ways are doing the same thing either you do this way or you do the other way which was this way both of them mean the same thing it's the dollar bracket expression dollar uh, dollar parenthesis expression is the same thing as a back tick and this back tick is not your usual quote mark but the button above the tab button one step above the tab button is this back tick below the tilde button that's what this back tick is and uh, that is uh, what is an alternative to expressions evaluation in shell having this uh, understood this piece what i would like to now do is actually run the play and you will see it succeed and as a consequence of success what is going to happen is that this root user will be disabled from any type of login unless you are directly on the computer there in wherever this machine is in seattle if you go there physically you can still connect through the password that you know in that browser website window here this password and uh, you can connect to that physically if you are still physically standing in front of the machine then you can but they won't allow you to go there having understood that piece the new user called cloud genius which has this password called 123 by the way this 123 we generated a shadow like this and that shadow is used and that we can still connect to the user remotely but only through ssh key based access even if you have your key in hand and you somehow manage to get rid of the key we'll we we'll likely do this we'll move the key away and attempt to connect to this machine using the 123 password and cloud genius username it will still fail and we want it to fail because we are preventing password based authentications also just like we are saying disallow root access of any type we are also disallowing password based authentication altogether so don't even allow anybody to use password even if they know it don't let them in so that's what you will see happening now i'll run ansible play the first time like this ansible playbook and then the user play and we invoke and it goes and quickly does the whole thing and boom it is done that will be the first time we are running so it is going to install sudo sudo is the package that is missing in uh, debian uh, default installations in cloud so we had to install sudo package which took some like a few seconds then we added the user called cloud genius then we added cloud genius user to super user or permissions then we added public key for cloud genius the user in the remote machine then we disallowed root access completely we disabled sss password based authentication so no don't allow even if you know the password don't let you in nobody can go in even i cannot and that's what we just did we allowed uh, disable gss api authentication and at the end we restarted our ssh daemon on the remote computer as a consequence of this if you now connect to that machine through ssh like this it will fail even if you know you have your keys in place you know you have the key is in hand right there it will still fail but if you attempt to connect to that machine using cloud genius login and the same ip address it will succeed it did it succeeded it succeeded because if you list here that key this this sorry this this uh, i should have cat not not ls i should have cat this uh, that key public key sitting in the right location it is sitting in 
the .ssh folder for the Cloud Genius user. It is also, by the way, sitting in the root.ssh folder. As you can see, permission is denied, so I have to go sudo, but it will show me. Uh, uh, H, there we go. So it, sh it shows you that key sitting right there. And this is the different key for the root login, but contents are the same. Let's go compare them, content. So we are comparing the content sitting in our uh, home user dot SSH and authorized keys file. And we are comparing this with the home, no, not home, the, the root user has the home called root dot SSH authorized keys file. And you will find that they are the same exact keys. I did not type it properly. Authorized keys. And they are the same content, exact identical content showing up. The keys in this location for the root user is the same public key sitting in the cloudgenius.ssh authorized keys for the Cloud Genius user. The same key, by the way. You can use different keys if you like. That's what you saw. Even though you have the keys and all in good place, good shape, you will still not be able to connect using the root login. That's one thing we, saw, we noted. The other thing we'll note is that this Cloud Genius user that we were able to connect to using the key-based authentication because the key that we have is in good shape and is in, in, in our hands in the keychain, it succeeded. What if I let move that key one more time? I'd say move my uh, key from here into some other location and also move the public key to some other location. And then this SS agent that I have, which currently has the agent in my memory, I would like to kill the agent. So basically get rid of the key from the keychain. So SSH add and then delete all the entries. Now, if I list them, I have nothing in my keychain. Now, if I attempt to connect to the root user, of course it will fail. So SSH root at should fail. This says access denied. Then I will attempt to connect using the Cloud Genius login. And here, if I attempt, it will still deny me. It will deny me because I don't have my keys in the keychain. Identity removed, already removed. If I put my identity back, it will let me in. One thing to note that even, even though I know my password for this Cloud Genius user and I know the password for the root user, I'm still not able to connect. That's another thing that we wanted. And so <clears throat> there's a question. Let's go read the question. So, uh, if, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the question is, if the task to create the Cloud Genius account fails, will the playbook continue to run and disable the root? SSH. No, the, if the task fails uh, for some reason of a user mistake or something else happens, the playbook will basically stop terminate at that point. It will break at that exact step. Let's see if I can simulate this, uh, what you just asked. Let's see if I can uh, find a way to simulate a crash at that, that point in time. So let's say, for example, No, I am not able to simulate a crash at the time of creation. Even if I make a deliberate mistake, I was trying to find out if I can make a mistake somewhere in this step or maybe this step to simulate a crash. Maybe there is, maybe there is a way. Uh, if you are to make, uh, uh, basically, let me, let me describe what I, what I have in mind to answer this question. Uh, what I was thinking of is to, <clears throat> to go the dash dash step function. This, this kind of a function, step-by-step -step execution function. That way we can actually break. And as you will see uh, that, you know, if I break the command at the end of maybe this, this play or that play, one of those two plays, which is at the time of creation of the Cloud Genius user, when I break it and don't let it go forward, nothing else actually happens. So it's kind of moot to actually break it because it is broken by design by me. I think the question uh, that you have the succinct answer to that is, if these steps fail, then the play breaks and the subsequent steps will not happen. 
which I think answers the question. So let's move, let me read it one more time. And I hope you can speak. If you can speak, Sue, that will be much better uh, if you have a yeah. microphone. Uh, I can, I can. Um, yes, you answered my question. I, for some reason, was thinking that even if that task failed, the playbook was going to continue to run. But um, okay. you answered the question. It won't. Okay, good, good, good. good. Sweet. So let us uh, uh, cross-check one last thing for you. And this is uh, something that I want to focus your attention on is on this idea here. Where is that? Here, this idea. Password-based authentication. We have disallowed that access, by the way. So just remember that piece. I'll come back to it in just a second. What I want to do is put my keys back in their spot, back in the right spot, which is right now in this location. I want to move them into this location. And I am moving my public key also into the same location. And then I'm evaluating SSH add and then saying SSH add list my keys. So the key is in good shape. Now I can connect to the machine like that, like this, and I'm inside the machine out there. Now here, what I want to do is simulate uh, a, a difference in behavior. So the behavioral difference in the machine that I want to actually simulate is simple. And I'll explain it to you before I do it. So what I want to do is override whatever I did here. I am saying in line number 44 and down, I disallow password-based authentication. I can manually go modify that piece. And I'll say, you know what, let's allow it for, for like a few minutes. I want to actually go and see if I can connect to the machine using a password that I know is one, two, three. But I want to, you know, maybe revert whatever I did in the playbook. So I'll have to manually do that piece. So I'll go to that location, say, what is that? I don't know where that noise came from, but hold on. This is strange. I think it is a bug in hammer spoon <laughs> that makes some uh, bang, uh, you know, some bell noise. Uh, so let's uh, let's go to that thing here. So what I want to do is go to sudo. And uh, then I would like to change that file called etc sshd. And in there, I have this file called sshd underscore config. In that file, what I want to do is to revert this change. Your password authentication says no. We would like to make it back the way it was, like password authentication. It somewhere should say yes. So where is that? Password authentication is saying yes. Where is that it's piece? The very, it was the very first match. No, that was the comment. Uh, the, the comment, this is commented out, right? This is a commented out entry. Yep. So it, uh, it's not the right one. The right entry is at the bottom, like right there. And so this is the entry that actually is active. The one at the top does not begin with the letter P. And therefore, that is not active. This entry is active. So we'll say yes. And kill the no part. So now, password authentication is allowed. We'll now save this file. And then we have to restart SSH daemon. So we'll say uh, service SSHD restart. So we restarted the service. Then we come out of this command prompt. And now on the local machine, no, one more time, come out of the command of the, one more time. Now back to the local machine. Uh, what I want to do is connect to that remote machine, but this time I want to use my password. Now I know that, you know, when I have this key in my hand, you know, it will just use the key. And so that's not what I want to simulate. So if I just go like that, it just connects. But that's not what I really want. So I'll move my keys one more time. <laughs> So just to test out password authentication is actually functional and working. So that's what I'll be, I'll be doing is moving my keys again. And this key movement is something I think I did the last time when I did it, I was doing it very, very quickly. And that is what threw people off. So that's why I'm making sure that I elaborate on that idea of what exactly is going on with this key movement business. So I moved the key. I also moved my public key. And now I will delete my entries in the agent that the SSH keychain. Now my identities are removed. 
I will now connect to that remote computer using the Cloud Genius login and attempt and expect it to ask me for a password. So here is the asking for password. I know my password is one, two, three. The shadow is sitting right there. That's what I used. So I'll type my password one, two, three and expect to get in. And I, I, I did. I am connected to the remote machine right now. You can see that this is a Debian computer. And uh, this is the same machine that we, had, we have been talking about. This is not the Cloud Genius workstation, by the way. It is the Ansible example machine. And logged in as the Cloud Genius user. And we can, you know, now having changed this, what I, now having changed this, what I would like to do again, I came out and then move that key back to way, the way it was, or so, the way it is supposed to be, which is again going to that same location. and evaluating my SSH agent. Now I have the keys in place. Now what I want to do is put it back the way it was supposed to be according to the playbook. So what I need to do is go back here and modify this as the Cloud Genius user. So that's the only way I can function correctly because the other ways are not appropriate because root user is disabled. The only way I can have this Ansible Play succeed in correcting the manually disturbed setting that I have disturbed this one setting that you recall, we just did that like two minutes ago. I manually disturbed, disturbed this setting. I said, password authentication, yeah, allow that for me to just play around and have fun with logging in using a password, which I did and it succeeded. The modification succeeded but that's not how the state of this machine should be according to my design in mind that I have in the playbook as defined in the playbook. So you will see when I run the play again, that this segment begins in line 44 through 51 will kick in again and it will actually take corrective action to reward the changes that I manually made on the machine. But this time it needs to run with this username. If you run it with the root user, it will fail and let's see the failure first. Let's see if we can fail. So Ansible playbook and then user YAML and here's the failure. The failure is unable to connect because this root user cannot connect. So let's go change to the right user that we have in mind, save it and then close this window. Look at the, look at the play itself. And you will see that this play that we have modified manually, this particular play will actually attempt to correct. So let's go see that correction happen. Run the play one more time. And every single thing will be no changes, green color, except one thing will be yellow color. And then restart SSH will be yellow color, which is what you just saw. So this yellow indicates a change happening which is to disallow SSH password authentication. It was allowed manually overridden by me. <clears throat> so it corrected that state and now it is disallowed one more time. And restart SSH handler. So restarted SSH. Now I cannot connect to the machine using password even if I have the password. It doesn't matter because it corrected that state that we wanted according to our design document which is what this playbook actually is. Every playbook, every cookbook basically is a design document. It's a specification of the state of desired outcome that you want for your infrastructure. So whatever you desire, whatever you come up with, you document that succinctly, as succinctly as possible using YAML files in Ansible, using cookbooks in Chef, and using God knows manifest in Puppet, and using using run books in DSC, desired state configuration from Microsoft. So every, people have different names for the same thing, like run book, play book, cook book, this book, that book, whatever book, I don't care. All I care about is what do I want in the result and how do I define it? That's what this thing was an exam, example of, is I, I made sure that I write down my design idea in an executable form. And what I just wrote, what I just said, is something to remember is, a playbook, cookbook, run book, this book, that book are basically executable design documents. I, I, I call them that because this, this is my design. I write that down and I'm actually executing it. 
execution of a design. And I implement the design through running a playbook in this example or running something else in other examples. So we'll, we'll do those things. This concludes this exercise and I'm switching topics. Uh, and uh, before I switch, I will open uh, for questions. If you have questions, please. And by the way, questions should you know come spontaneously. Don't wait for me for a good moment to ask questions. That's not how I work. If you have a question, we'll answer it. I just ran the same example on Ubuntu and I'm still able to log in as Ubuntu. Yes, Ubuntu is good because that is not root, right? Because I mean, there was no failure or nothing, but I mean, I updated to Ubuntu. I, I ran it on the Ubuntu machine. Right, so you are probably on Amazon Cloud. Yep. And uh, uh, the, the idea in the documentation is specifically to disable root user. Oh, okay. Not Ubuntu user. Ubuntu is an okay user. I mean, that's the reason why Amazon uses Ubuntu login as opposed to root login is because root logins are considered not a good practice. That is the reason why Amazon Linux or rather Amazon Cloud using Ubuntu Linux will give you a non-root user by default. They're doing, they're doing good things by default. Cool, thank you. <clears throat> uh, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that this cloud is not good or DigitalOcean is not good. It's just the usage scenario is different. These clouds, the smaller ones like DigitalOcean and Vulture Cloud are good for development purposes. So they already know that the majority of the audience is developers and developers know what they're doing. So at least it's assumed that they know, they know what they're doing. So they give them root access because that's what developers ask for. They, they ask for simplicity. I need to get it to run quickly and get my results done fast. And so that's the idea behind uh, these kind of smaller clouds is to get to production quickly as quickly as possible. And so I just deleted that machine. And to compete with these smaller clouds, as you will see in Amazon's case, Amazon has come up with a simple cloud, for example. I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. If you, have, if you know about it, that's great. But here is what I have in mind for you to take notice. Just like DigitalOcean, just like, uh, just like um, Vulture Cloud, and there are a bunch of other clouds. Uh, just like these guys, the smaller players, what Amazon has done is created a simple cloud. It is actually not called a simple cloud. It's called something else. What is it called? It's called LightSail. It looks like DigitalOcean. I mean, I'm not kidding. Let's go look at it. Here it is. Looks just like DigitalOcean does and not much complexity. Uh, as long as it works, apparently it's not in the mood of working right now. <laughs> Come on, yeah. So you can give SSH key, and uh, you know you can probably start a machine there. So create an instance, pretty similar and simple. And here we go. You get choose to Linux or Windows, whatever you want. And so you say Linux, and say okay, in Linux I want OS only, so I can get Amazon, Ubuntu, Debian, FreeBSD, OpenSUSE, SUSE. And uh, let's go select Ubuntu. And so then you choose the $5 machine, $10 machine, simple, and you boom, create. That's how simple it can be. That's the compet competition from Amazon to Vulture, to DigitalOcean, to another cloud that I will also cover. Uh, we'll, we'll do this cloud also. It's actually fancy in a sense that it gives you bare metal machines. Like, uh, bare metal SSD on the cloud. And this is a European cloud. It is pretty dirt, dirt, dirt cheap. I mean, cheap as in, I, you, I'll let you see what, what I mean by cheap. Really, really cheap cloud. And it works most of the time. <laughs> just, just saying, you know, most of the time it works out okay. So that's the cloud. I, I think it is coming up very rapidly in uh, European regions. This is interesting because it gives you bare metal SSD cloud servers. And this seconds is kind of questionable. It takes more than a few seconds. Uh, I mean, it sometimes takes more than a few minutes, but thank goodness it is only minutes, not hours. So just, just correcting what they are describing here, not seconds, but well, it can take any number of seconds. They did not say one second. So that's, I think, technically okay. But this is a good cloud. Uh, you should take a look. The reason you should take a look at it is it is different. 
is that they are not using any hypervisors. There are no virtual machines in here. They're just giving you direct access to bare metal physical machines, which is interesting uh, from usage perspective and performance perspective. There are also other clouds pretty much in the same lines, uh, which is called packet.net. Another cloud gives you physical machines on demand, bare metal. And it's expensive. This one is not cheap. So just, you know, if you're ready for it, go take it. Competing with these bare metal people, uh, bare metal cloud companies is what you will see here in this cloud, Vulture Cloud. They have, I think, just started up with the idea of bare metal also. So here we go, bare metal machines. They don't have too many choices. So only limited locations it's like New York temporarily sold out. So let's see, Miami is available. So in Miami, you can choose Debian and uh, you can select, excuse me, only one machine type, uh, one machine size. This is the size. I mean, that's the available choice. So limited availability, but still people are evolving in that direction, as you can see here. That's something to note where metal is coming up. And in, in, in this cloud, another interesting thing that you will notice is this ARM. 64 series. That is something that will eventually disrupt the industry. As such, today is all x86 64 bit CPUs on the cloud, most of them. But these, these, this company has come up with a ARM V8 SSD based cloud server at a fairly, fairly cheap price 12 euros per month. They give you eight ARM cores and decent performance. I mean, I, I, I have used it, it, it seems to work okay. So that is, we'll do, an, we'll do a, a very, very complex exercise with this at some point, uh, which is about, it's focused on storage, high availability applications. We'll discuss those aspects uh, in maybe in the third segment, architecture segment, uh, but just keep that in mind. With that, uh, any questions are welcome or I will change the topic uh, for us to cover, which is back to that Docker thing, which is uh, I want to go uh, build a Docker setup and then play with Docker in much more detail than we did before. So what I would like to do is in this setup that we have, I would like to create a machine out here. And uh, let us see with that Docker exercise which we did the last time, where was that? Uh, what was it called? Let's go there. Uh, Docker exercise was, I think Docker Ansible, that was the name. If I'm, if I'm remembering right, I think the name was Docker Ansible. So I'll just type it here manually and get to it, Docker Ansible. That should be it. And I'll grab that link from here, paste it in Slack chat for you to ready refer, refer to it as we go along playing with that exercise. I'll take that exercise into our virtual machine right here and I will move away from this folder and go to clone the Docker Ansible. So it doesn't exist currently. So I'll say git clone and that thing, so it clones up locally. And I will also close this window. So remove the project folder and then go to Docker Ansible and then Atom open it in Atom. Atom should open up with that. We have an inventory file. We have some host variables and a bunch of different examples and a host file that contains one of these places. So in that location, what I want to do is make sure that I am creating a new machine that in, in a cloud where I will use the root login for this machine called late for dinner. That's the name I will be using by the way. And I will assign the IP address in this location and like that, uh, keep, keep looking at the rest of the things. We have the root user, we have the private key in the right spot, we have our Python interpreter, which is Python 3 called out. So the same way like we wrote before, except our IP address will be different. We'll be not dealing with any other machine, just one. So I'm commenting them all out and just focusing on this one machine in line number 10. And saving it, I need to change this IP address as I create a new box. So here we go. We'll go create a new box in this cloud and we'll say, you please give me a new machine somewhere in Debian running a decent size box, like $40 per month. 
And here I will, you know, add my add my key in the Linux box. Then I'll give this a machine. I'll say uh, Docker Ansible. Is that the name, right? Yeah. So Docker Ansible. By the way, these names are irrelevant. Absolutely no relevance. Maybe maybe we can call it late for dinner. Late for dinner. And so this is just funny names, nothing else. So uh, Seattle location, Debian, Linux, decently big size machine. I'm deliberately choosing a little bit bigger machine because I want to use this machine with a variety of Docker exercises right now. I will, after this build up step happens, we will have the machine become a Docker host and then we will play inside the Docker host with a variety of exercises to understand how do we leverage Docker as the, as the foundation for increasingly more complex setups. They might sound complex, but as you will see, the implementation is actually fairly simple, and we'll see that. But let's go first create a decently big size machine. This is four CPU, eight GB RAM. I'm probably overkilling it, but whatever. It's $40 per month, meaning if I use it for one hour, it's going to be peanuts, who cares? So your $10 coupon you might have from these guys or from DigitalOcean, they all will consume uh, you know, only a portion of your $10 worth of credit that you already have with them. So with this, pick the key, give it a name and start. The machine starts and I will expect to receive an IP address. I will use that IP address in that location right here. And then I will review what else I have for the late for dinner machine. I have a YAML file which says username is root. Then I will also look at my Ansible configuration, which says my inventory of machines is sitting in that file called hosts in a folder called inventory. That's what I was looking at that file. Then I will go back to look at my Ansible configuration one more time. And what I also read here is that the roles path I have is this roles folder, which doesn't exist by the way right now. So I will create that folder called roles. This is not necessary. You can create a folder, but it is not strictly necessary to have this folder to begin with. It will automatically get created. So I'm deleting that folder, but you can totally create that folder as defined in line number three manually if you like. I deleted that because I can show you that it automatically gets created in that location. When I run the galaxy command to grab a role that I want to use in this particular play. Now here, host key checking is true, uh, which is we can make it false. So to, to make it easy on us so that we don't have to say yes on the prompt. And deprecation warnings are true, we can make them false. Again, it is not necessary, but just I don't want to see warnings right now. Uh, so that's what I just did. Now having done this part, I will grab this IP address, copy it properly, bring it here, paste it in the right location, like that, and save. All the other lines up on top are not really useful, at least for today. So I'm deleting all of them. Only one line, only one host, which is the late for dinner machine, and the Ansible configuration as you, as you see here and the host file, I'm also closing it out. Now I will read the readme file. In that readme file, I, I have to edit the inventory file, which I already did, for provided the IP address, and then I will pull down a role from the Galaxy. The role I will be using is called angstward.docker. That's the name of the role. It's created by this guy called Paul, as you saw the last time, if you remember. You can always visit the Ansible Galaxy and identify and look at other roles. And thanks for Docker Ubuntu is the role I want to actually grab. So I will bring that command here in our Docker Ansible folder and say, please get me the role created by this gentleman into the role folder. So it automatically knows where to put it because that's what this configuration says to put the roles in the roles path. The role path happens to be roles folder. That's where you will see a new folder created when I run the Galaxy install. It will now create a roles folder and dump your play, dump your role from the Galaxy in that spot. So it was successfully installed. Good to know. Now we'll, we'll go and examine that role quickly. 
Yeah, it's, it's sitting right there. Good, I don't need to go inside right now because I want to just use it. So the way to use it is to run the play. Now, what play do I want to really run is on this target host that I have in mind. I want to run the Docker play, which is this play. So the play is very simple. What does the play say? Uh, that I need to uh, basically run the role. That's pretty much it. You may have seen that you can make it kernel present latest, if you like to get the latest kernel. You can modify it like that if you want to get the latest kernel package state and also add this username to the Docker group. By the way, our user is root, so it doesn't need that last line. This line is not necessary, but I'm keeping it, not changing it. With that understood, I'm gonna save it, close it, and then run the play as described in the readme file. I have to run this play. So copy, bring it here, and then this machine magically becomes a Docker host. And then we'll stop this exercise and start another exercise on the same box, the same box that I have here called late for dinner. I want to use this box as my Docker machine or Docker host and play some Docker exercises right on that box. So that's why I, I need that IP address and I'll use it for a different exercise after I prepare it for use in our Ansible demonstration of setting up that machine in form of a Docker host. So <clears throat> let's go execute the play. Why is it saying, please note your server will be still finishing. That is not what I want to see though. So maybe still finishing, installing and booting up. Yeah, whatever. I don't want to see you. I don't want to see this notice. I don't like it. Why is it saying that? Still finishing and installing and booting up in the first few minutes of whatever, just do it, man. Okay, so what I'm uh, concerned about is this notice that I'm seeing. And so what I'm figuratively doing right now is walking up to the machine as if I'm there and connecting to the console. This only some clouds provide this kind of access, by the way. Let me just repeat what I just said. You know, you, I may have caught you by surprise. I'm noticing this, this note, which I don't like it, by the way. You know, why don't you just do it yourself and just do, tell me that you're done. But they're telling me to go somewhere and monitor progress. So I want to go to the machine as if I'm there physically in that building and connect, connect to the console, right? This machine that I have, I can connect to the console and only certain clouds give you this kind of an access. But here, you are on the late for dinner machine on the console of this computer and you type the root login and grab the password from here, copy the password and go back to the uh, window here and manually paste the password like this. And I hope I did it right. I did not. So root login again and password again. and I'm not able to run it for some reason. So root login again and type the password by right clicking, please. Okay, come on, let me type the password. Apparently, no, that's not how it works in this virtual console. So I had to manually type it one item after the other, which means I have to see the password. Ouch, that's a complex password. Okay, so let's go type it. This is this is like a one-time thing. I'll, I'll, this is kind of if you if you understand what I'm doing, I'll not bore you with this. If you understand what I'm doing, please tell me that because I don't really want to type that that long string. But please tell me that you want to skip this. You want me to skip this, please. That's what I want to hear. Uh, otherwise, I'll type this this password that I have into the console to see what is in the machine that is prompting me to look at it. So let's yeah, go. It makes sense. You're just trying to log into the to the VM. So. Correct, 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 correct. I'm logging into the machine directly as if I'm standing right there and I'm typing this password that I'm looking at mechanically one at a time. Question mark four three at G capital Y N N P D at symbol and okay. Please let me in. Ouch. Okay, I'm giving up and say, go bye-bye. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing that thing. I'm just going to refresh the screen and hope it works.
or just ignore it and see what happens. We'll deal with it. So let's go move, move forward. I'll just run the play. And you know what happens? This machine becomes a Docker host. So that's what's going to happen. And then we will, you know, skip this exercise, move, move on after this exercise is done. So I'm closing it. And I'm going to switch on another exercise, but this time I will use the same machine, by the way, to run a different exercise. That exercise I want to run is called Docker files. And it is right here. That file uh, has a Git remote. Let's go see what the Git remote is. And we'll go to that location ourselves in GitHub. And so that's the Git location. We'll copy it, give it to you in Slack chat right there. That's the example exercise I will run, but I'll run it on that remote machine so that we can actually do some meaningful work. So that's the multi-container architecture exercise that I'm actually going to begin doing right now. And that is what I will like to run in this Docker host as soon as it becomes ready for me, this late for dinner machine. So essentially what I will do is SSH connect to the machine called late for dinner uh, with its IP address, which is available somewhere here. So copy that IP address and paste it. And I'm connected to the machine out there. It is doing some stuff, so I don't want to mess with it. Let it do. You can see what it's doing or rather uh, top what it's doing. And so you can see what's going on under the hood as Ansible is doing its thing. You can see that it is doing some things like HTTP access and you know some apps saw I saw app before and now Docker is probably getting set up. You can examine what it is doing, but I don't want to mess with it right now. So I'm just waiting for it to finish the action of completing the installing, making it a Docker host, and at the end we will play in that machine directly. That's the the computer we connected to. It's called Late for Dinner. We have root access there, and uh, it is currently installing these guys right now. What's that cloud service called? Which one? What that you're trying to use? The this oh, the sorry. cloud. The the company the yeah. cloud company yeah this yeah. company is called Vulture. I I don't know how to say it, but that's the name. Okay. I I don't know how to pronounce the name by the way, because they don't tell me. You're you're, you're, pronouncing, you're pronouncing it right. I I saw a video about them, and it is Vulture. They're, they're it's just the. It's the new way of, of dropping. Like the Flickr or Vulture type thing? Flickr, Instagram, I this, I that, E this, E that. <laughs> yeah, it's just their okay. marketing. Okay. <laughs> so you don't know why it's taken so long? Uh, no, it is supposed to take that long. It, it, it's, it's an elaborate install with a bunch of packages that we expect. Uh, so it, it should take, it, should, it just finished. So it finished correctly, uh, said it changed eight items and that machine is now ready with Docker. So let's go see. Now here in that machine, we have Docker. Let's go see that we have, we have it or not. Apparently we do. So now our Ansible exercise creating some Docker setup is ready. So we quit that window and focus on this window. In here, we are connected to that machine directly. The machine is a uh, Ubuntu, sorry, it's not J, what Debian, no, Debian stretch machine. We have Docker running uh, and we have no Docker images available. And then we have nothing else also available, right? So we'll clone it. We'll clone something, uh, clone, uh, not Vulture, but <laughs> what am I cloning? I need to grab that GitHub link, uh, GitHub link from here, Docker files. This I want to clone using HTTPS and say clone it, please and clone it on the remote machine out there in Vulture Cloud. So clone this. So it is cloned. Now we'll go inside there. So, the, so that's cloning the same thing we cloned? Yeah, you can, you can by the way, let, let's, before we, we, we just, I think I, 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 I would like to make it easy on you. So what I would like to do is come out of this machine and be directly on our workstation. In this workstation, we are here. We know this, but our familiar can, can environment. You, can you increase the font a bit? Yes. So what I would like to do is, before we jump onto that remote Docker machine, I would like to run the same exact exercise I have in mind. I will run it right here in the workstation first, which means rm-rf docker files, 
and then a permission denied. Okay, hold on. So let's see, uh, sudo rm minus rf docker files. I'll, I'll do the whole thing here first, and then we'll do this exercise remotely also. It will be easier to understand it, easier, easier this way, because you have it here right now with you, as opposed to setting up a machine with this and that, and then make it more complex. We'll do the complex part also, but simply run it, the whole thing is able to run, you are able to run it right here by doing git clone this, right here. We'll be able to do that step by step. We will evolve it first. Do it here, and then quickly do it on the remote machine also. The remote machine is running up and there, up and running right here, and we'll leave it running like that. Don't worry about it. But back here, we have this new folder, Docker files cloned locally. So I'll go inside there. Oops, Docker files. So I'm in there now. Atom, open it up. So Atom will open up and I'll put this terminal on one half and Atom on the other. So here is Atom and here is terminal on the other half. And this way, we'll adjust the font a little bit. And tell me if the font is too small, too big. And then inspect, what do we have? Now here we have a bunch of things. We ran a part of this exercise already once, if you recall, you know, maybe a couple, couple sessions ago. So now we'll extend the exercise further to help us understand Docker capabilities. And we are running right in the workstation. This machine is running out there. We we'll leave it running. We'll visit that in after we quickly finish this step in the workstation itself. Now, what are we trying to accomplish here is to play with a variety of scenarios in running multi-tier complex applications all in one box. So that's the design. Currently, that's the design. We'll expand it to multiple boxes and all that good stuff. But for right now, everything runs on one box. And that's the box. And also right now, this is also another box. So this workstation itself is a box. Now, let me draw a picture for you. So the picture is like this. <clears throat> so what I want to accomplish is set up a multi-tier architecture of some combination of applications, but all of them will be sitting on one box. This is the box. This box can be your Cloud Genius workstation, or it can be the one late for dinner, or it can be any other box. It needs to have Docker capabilities, by the way. That, that's the requirement. So which means we should be able to create containers arbitrarily as we like. And then we would like to see users visit this box, the IP address of this box. And users will visit. And we would like to see, let them see different services running in different containers. Like that. Now each of these containers will carry different applications, completely different applications. And I would like to have a setup in which this user should be able to call something by name. Like, you know, I want to call this, uh, say, uh, Times of India. So the Times of India is running here in C4. This user should be able to type HTTP Times of India. And as a consequence, I would like that routing of this traffic of this user asking this Times of India by name should be diverted to appropriate container number C4. And that's where he or she should be able to see what they expect to see. And the traffic should be correctly routed like this. That's my expectation. When another user comes in and they have another idea in mind, let's say they're looking at uh, uh, going to see Fox News, for example, or maybe another user wants to see CNN as another example. So multiple users come in. So here this user comes in and he or she says, I want to see the CNN container. So the routing should happen automatically and they should be able to see the CNN site. And this next user comes along and says, this person who, who wants to see the Fox News website. So you go to the same IP address, by the way, same IP, that's the critical thing, same IP address. 
you visit the same IP address with different names, HTTP colon slash slash Fox News or slash slash CNN, same IP address. And this person who wants to visit Fox News should automatically get routed to the Fox News container. That's the expectation that I have from my design. And we have it implemented in the example I will demonstrate to you and it will be easy to understand what is going on under the hood provided I describe it to you ahead of time before I do it. That's what I just did. So this kind of a setup is called a reverse proxy. Let's go define what a reverse proxy actually does. So a uh, uh, pen change, color blue. Uh, reverse proxy is basically, you can use any technology to implement, but the idea is you call resources by their names. And so you go an HTTP name address, a DNS name. It may go to the same IP address, that's the material. But as long as the name being asked for is the one that you provide, according to the name, it will automatically route traffic to the appropriate serving resource. So whatever that resource is that is going to serve the resource, it will show exactly what the routed uh, the routed traffic will get routed to the exact location where the resource is going to be served from. And you can have a common IP collectively sharing and distributing traffic to multiple destinations, which will actually be serving content depending on various choice of names. Now this reverse proxy implementation, you can go implement using Nginx. You can implement using HA proxy, and there are many other implementations. These are two commonly used open source implementations. This is extremely popular. Nginx, this is also popular, but this is the one I want to use today. And what I want to do is, since we have just one box, so we basically have one IP address for the whole box, and I, in here, I want to put in a reverse proxy. I want to put in a CNN container. I want to put in a Times of India container. I want to put in a Fox News container and I want to put in another container of some other type, like, you know, maybe the Cloud Genius website container. I'm just making it up, making names up. And then I will have users, user number one, user number two, user number three, and multiple users. They will ask these resources by their name and we just have one IP address. I mean, this box has one IP. So each of these names will basically have a DNS mapping to the same IP address. This is an academic exercise, but remember that this is mostly uh, for us to understand how do you orchestrate multiple containers together in a meaningful fashion on a cluster of machines, beginning with a cluster of one. So this is the cluster, one machine. We'll begin small, make it complex. So first, so simple and small examples to begin with. We're still using the same construct you will use in a larger context. You will have some kind of a gateway. A gateway is the entry point from which these users will come in. And they will go through the gateway, which is where the reverse proxy will actually sit. The reverse proxy will then divert your traffic according to the demand of the user. And these containers themselves can then sit on other boxes. Right now, just one box. And in fact, just this box, the workstation we have. That's the design. To implement this reverse proxy, we'll also use another container. So it will be some container called CRP. That container, it's a special container. We have to run it. And it, it will run right here inside the same box, the same IP address, one box. And then we'll create a bunch of other containers like this. And these guys may have other dependencies on other things in life. So they may need other resources to collaborate and operate. And sometimes there'll be more resources that these guys can use together. And maybe this one also, and maybe the extra resource that only this one uses like that. So you can construct whatever mapping you want in terms of bunch of resources running in independent containers, all in a given cluster of machines, beginning with a cluster of one this one. So to make this happen, we have to, first of all, understand that we'll begin with a simple example, which is, this is the file name for that. 
And in this file, we have to copy YAML snippets from other files. So we'll copy that first example that I want to actually make use of, which I think we ran once before, but it was not you know, in, in a full blown context as to what we are, it was a different context. I just, I think I remember demonstrating this example to you, but don't know if you actually remember that we did. And if you think that, you know, you can understand this, that's great. But just quickly, let me go through this example to help you understand what we are really trying to accomplish. If you look at this example, which I'm going to copy from here in the three tier YAML file, this file, and copy that and then close it and dump it in the main file here. What you just saw me do is that I created three segments, the data segment, the DB segment, and the WP segment. These three segments are essentially going to create three different containers. Right? So we can see how it works out, which is very easy to run now, now that we have this Docker Compose YAML in our hand. We have three containers defined. And since you have done it already, I'll do it very quickly. What I will do is just bring up the stack. How do you bring it up? You say Docker Compose, and let's see if the processes are running there. So I, I, we might uh, be, we, have, we may have to kill some Nginx processes running from a previous exercise. So let me just see if uh, Nginx is running. Yes, it is running. So let's go remove that Nginx first. Are you wanting to do this on your local, on the VM here, or are you wanting to do this on the- Both. Uh, the other one. First here, then there. First in okay. the local VM, then we'll go there and do it also. Okay, so thanks. It, it is easy to run it right here. That's why I'm beginning here to help us understand. And everybody can do it without having to wait for the other machine to get ready. That's why I'm doing it this way. So we just removed that Nginx. I would also like to clean up another thing that needs to be a sudo app to get auto remove. And that piece also is gone. As a consequence, we should not have anything running there on the port number 80. And we don't have it anymore. Great, cleaned up. So now to bring up this stack, which is three containers, one, two, and the third one at the bottom. These three container stack, I want to bring up, I'll say Docker Compose up. That's it, that's all it takes. Docker Compose up. And I want to run this, particular compose process in the background. So put a dash D at the end. So it will go in the background, create three containers and tell me that it did. And now we have it running. We can see that we have three containers running right there. You can make it a little bigger to make it readable. And Docker PS dash A, you can see that three containers up and running. Uh, one of them is not actually actively running because it exited successfully with a zero, zero means success, but the other two containers are running. You can actually access this container at visiting port number 80 on the box itself. This mapping, if you carefully look, it reads like this. Any traffic that goes on the machine from anywhere originating on the internet, att attempting to hit the port number 80 on the machine, should be directed to the port number 80 in the container inside this container, this ID. That's how it reads. That's the critical part to understand. Any traffic coming from anywhere, hitting port 80 on this box, should be diverted to port number 80 on that container, this ID. That's how you read it. So what is that, whatever I read, should actually be functional now, which means I should go here and visit the port number 80 on that box, which is where I am right now. So I'm opening a browser right now. And in that browser, I will go visit localhost. And what do I expect to see? I expect to see WordPress. And so here it comes. And you can finish it off. You know, the finishing part is kind of boring. So I'm not doing it, but you got the point. So we are able to create a three tier stack, one, two, and three at the bottom, three tier stack with just simplicity of running Docker compose up dash D as a daemon run in the background. And then these three containers are running, big deal. 
I mean, literally, uh, easy deal compared to the chef exercise. This is what we just did. And it took us only this much code, practically only this much code. It, it's very fairly condensed in terms of what we are able to accomplish because most of the work is done by Docker. Now I'll kill everything I have and I expand the exercise into further complexity. So we'll kill it first. Docker ps dash a. So Docker a general purpose kill command is Docker Docker Byron dash. Let me remember. I don't remember it. Let me type it. Then I'll read it later on. So this is the command, a general purpose kill everything command. So now we have nothing running. I will copy that for you as a ready reference in your Slack chat. So you can also use it to kill, kill all, kill all the containers right there. So now we have nothing running. And now I want to expand the exercise. What I want to do now is erase all this, make it clean like it was to begin with, save it. And then look at the other example the other examples we have there are other examples and then there are main examples and let's go see them one at a time so i think i'll just quickly look at what the examples are and then we'll talk about them i think the main example is what i want to begin now here we have to understand this example because it's fairly long and here, uh, let's go first thing first, copy the whole example as is, copy from this example YAML file, put that in the Docker Compose YAML file. That's the file name that is expected by Docker Compose. It should be that name, Docker Compose dash YAML. So I'll save it here in that file. I brought it from the main examples file from here, copied the whole thing into this empty file template which has the right name, by the way, docker compose dash, sorry, docker dash compose dot YAML is the name that is expected. And that is what we have, containing the right set of code that we need for the second exercise in Docker. And what this exercise is, is kind of you know, a long exercise. We, we, we will see what it contains currently. So we, it is long in terms of how many lines we have, 93. Okay, but let's see what it contains. If you look at, uh, this example, this portion, that's it. Only this portion, specifically line number 11 through 17. That's how I think I should focus on just that one. If you look at this definition, it is a container definition that uses a container called Nginx proxy. This by the way is a reverse proxy. It is available in this location. It is created by this gentleman, Jason Wilder, this guy. And he has created this container that I will be using. The way he created this container is described in this, in this particular project. It describes how to use it and further documentation. So that's what I, it has like 1,465 forks, 7,000 stars, so pretty popular and actually useful. So I will be using this as a ready-made container available in Docker Hub. If you go to Docker Hub and search for Nginx proxy, you will find it. You will also find Nginx itself, but that's not what we want. We want this container, not the Nginx container, but the JSON Builder Nginx proxy container. That one is what I'm interested in. So that can be used specifically by that name. It has to be this name, J Builder Nginx proxy. When you use that name, you will get this image. That's the name I have chosen here. See that image name, J Wilder Nginx proxy. So I'm using this image and I will create my proxy setup, my Nginx reverse proxy setup, pretty much like this. In my box, I'm creating my first container. Everything else is dead, by the way, to begin with, nothing is running. So my first container is the reverse proxy container I want to create. And I want to make sure that the reverse proxy port number 80 is mapped directly to the machine port number 80. That mapping you can see right here. And then 
according to the documentation, you need to specify a volume and map Docker socket in this location, in the temporary location inside the container in a read-only fashion. So it's a volume mapping that is necessary according to the Nginx documentation, sorry, not Nginx, but JSON Builder's reverse proxy documentation requires this volume creation. This is how JSON Builder's Nginx proxy is able to look at other containers. You can have any number of them as long as the machine can handle it. That's why we have chosen a bigger machine on the cloud. Uh, we will run multiple containers here and this reverse proxy will be able to detect the presence of these guys because it is necessary, right? You need reverse proxy to know that we have the other containers running. So they should be able to detect that. And that detection happens through this volume mapping, which is connecting to the Docker socket. That's what is going on in this volume mapping. And then whenever the reverse proxy container fails, you just restart it. That's our policy. We are setting in line number 17. So this sets up our Nginx reverse proxy container easily. This is done. Next, we'll now create other containers. Other containers meaning this one as one example. This is a standalone container. It runs WordPress and it doesn't require other things like you saw here before in uh, this example that we ran just a few minutes ago. We saw that it requires three containers. Docker does at least WordPress in that example requires these containers. WordPress can run on its own everything in one container also, which is a bad design. That's not how you should run WordPress in production. Don't put all the eggs in one basket. Don't put the database container and the application container in the same container. Don't do that. Put this image and that image in two different containers at least and put the data elsewhere, some other location, like some other location. We just chose this location, but it needs to be some other location, something else, not here and not here. Now, WordPress, you can put all of these things in one container, which is a bad design. And that is what this example is, is a bad design. It is created by this company called Tutum, which is acquired by Docker. There used to be a company called Tutum.co, which got acquired by Docker. So now it is a part of Docker and it is what is now these days known as the Docker cloud. Don't confuse yourself to think that Docker cloud is a cloud. It is not. It, it, names, it is named like a cloud, but it is not actually a cloud. It's a service to run Docker containers in the cloud of your choice. So you can sign up. It is free, I think, for basic usage, but for commercial usage, I think you have to pay for it. Uh, but you can still play with it. It is uh, available for us to experiment with. This is what Tutum Cloud was, and now it has become the Docker Cloud. It doesn't actually is, it's not a cloud. It's a service that helps you uh, connect to a variety of clouds, for example. Let's see if I can, uh, where is that? Nodes and action create. And you can choose, uh, where is the settings? There is some setting to care. Here it is. So you can connect this with Amazon, connect with DigitalOcean, connect with Microsoft, connect with Soft, Socket, Softlayer, Packet, bunch of different cloud companies you can connect this Docker Cloud to and have the Docker Cloud as a service configure and run Docker for you. They will bill you for it. And uh, you, know, you have to pay for it if you're using it, but it used to be free. And I think I have some extra free from my previous Tutum usage. So that is not there available today. I have something free here, after five free something, but ignore that. I think one is free only for, for, for people who are joining today. So that's Docker Cloud created by a company called Tutum. And I am looking at the Docker Hub, which is where I am going to look for this 
bad design image, which I'm just picking up as an example as to how things should not be done. But I'm just for ease of ease of creating a quick container for me to demonstrate these guys is I'm just chosen that container. It's not technically, it's, not, it's going to work, but it's not a good design. So it is as simple as setting up this. So here I'm going to name this one as CNN. Just naming it, right? CNN, uh, or rather, I should I should label it clear, clearly. Clearly, I think I made a mistake in labeling it, so I'll undo that. And I should say the name that I want to use is C1 instead of C1. I will call it CNN.com. Just just naming it like that. So with this part, what is going to happen is going to look for an image called Tutum WordPress and run this segment as a standalone container, all inclusive, all by itself, with no other dependencies, contains a database, it contains a storage element, everything that is needed for WordPress to run should run in this one container available to us in this location called Tutum WordPress. I hope it is still available. Yeah, that one. That one is still available. So that is Tutum WordPress. It is kind of old, two years ago, and it is not the recommended way, but it is still there. So I'll use it as an example as to just creating quickly CNN.com. Just one example case. Now we'll look at other machines here, other containers here. I should not say machines. Uh, back here. Look at other ones. So here we have the proper way of doing WordPress in containers in distinctly different components, which is the official library based WordPress image, not the Tutum WordPress, but just WordPress, which is based on the Docker library maintained by WordPress company and the people behind WordPress itself. So this is going to be a two part three part story, I think it will be two parts or three parts. Yeah, three parts, the same example we ran before, but this time behind a reverse proxy. So you'll see that this C2 is going to be the front end facing container. And so let's call this one C2, this virtual host that I have labeled here C2 is the way that you communicate with reverse proxy as to what this thing is. And so let us call this one India times. To save it. So I saved that name in two different places, one for the name of the container and one for virtual host label so that reverse proxy will understand what we are talking about when somebody says, give me India times. So it knows where to go, India times. .com. That virtual host reference that you're looking at here is the way to communicate to the reverse proxy that you know what any traffic that goes and asks for India times, please send in, send them to this container, this one to be specific. So that is what is expected. It will show up in the right location. So does that actually update the reverse proxy files? And yes, way? yes, exactly. Okay. So it will, it will modify the Nginx configuration inside dynamically. So Nginx reverse proxy, JSON builder proxy, will look for this flag line number 37 and look for any new coming containers and containers will come and die and appear again and disappear again. So the, the reverse proxy will keep an eye on this label line 37, for example, or line 26, for example, at the top with CNN.com as a virtual host, line 37, India Times as a virtual host, as these virtual host labels, it will keep track of through the Docker socket and automatically regenerate the Nginx configuration inside the reverse proxy to make things work like you expect. You will see that happening and when we run this play actually. So it's not a play, it's a Docker composition. So <clears throat> that piece is just a part of the puzzle. It still requires a database. So we have the database right there. Sorry, this database right here and the corresponding storage element which stores the location is also right there. So this is another container 61, 62 that will store the data behind the database here. 
And this idea here that we are dealing with is the actual container. So in effect, the design will become, and the design will become something like this. Let me draw the picture one more time. Where is the picture? Picture, please, there. So here, picture. So what we are thinking of up until now, we discussed reverse proxy. Then we have this cnn.com, which is just one container, which all inclusive WordPress, everything inside, database, storage, everything. The next one is India Times. Dot com and this doesn't contain a database so it needs another container which runs your mysql software and then this needs another container that stores the data so that's the design up until now let's go, go let's go further where is that here yeah so in in further steps uh, we just saw the india times idea Next one is database. Next one is the data storage. And then comes Fox News. So this C3 is going to be our Fox News. So let's go C3 label and call it foxnews.com. Hey, Nilesh, what yes. keyboard command shortcut are you using to um, write to both locations in here, Adam? That's a good question. Uh, so in Atom and in Sublime, uh, what you do is if you want to go select uh, some string that you want to repeat, for example, the, the string I want to repeat is C3. So I select C3 in one location, and then I press Control D or Command D on Macintosh or Control D on Linux, and so multiple times. So one, two, three, four, it will include and highlight all occurrences of the pattern that you selected to begin with. And this is how multi-line edits, this is one way to implement multi-line edits concurrently. So you just select a portion, you double control D, command D multiple times. It will highlight for you and then you type Fox News. Okay, thank you. That's it. And then save. So that created, or rather this describes the Fox News container which is going to be a different application, completely different from WordPress. It is not WordPress, it is called Joomla. Joomla is uh, another open source project. Uh, Joomla looks like this. And so that's where you download it from. It is also open source, so you can use it. Many sites are built using Joomla also. So that's Joomla. It needs a database, by the way. So it is not a standalone design, which means you need to provide it a database. So what I want to do is be lazy and just use the database that I already created. Right. What I did was uh, this database that I already have. So just put this Joomla thing right here and we'll call it uh, what Fox News. And I am going to be lazy. So what I'll say, you know what, you just share this. Come on, sharing, sharing is good. Sharing is good pro as long as the customer is happy. So if you're doing it for a customer who knows what you're doing, then it is okay. It's okay to do it like this. The customer need to know that you are sharing the same database server between India Times and Fox News. And that is okay. Both of these guys need to know that. This guy and this guy. They need to know what you just did. You're sharing the database. Are you kidding me? Try that with CNN and then Fox News. Try the same thing if it was CNN and Fox News. Try using the same setup. They will come and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> just saying, uh, just you know that that's a political joke, a uh, joke, a political bad joke of the day. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it is. Uh, let's put the India Times here. So don't do that. Uh, in the, uh, don't don't use the database server for different customers. Bad idea. It will work just fine. It has no security implications as such because you are using different tables, but. Don't do that. Doesn't make customers happy. It does not. So don't don't do that. Okay. So this is how we are setting it up. By the way, just remember that we are doing it this way. So make sure that you tell your customer, India Times and Fox News, that you are going to share the database, save them some money, by the way, and save you some hassle. And it's not not actually a hassle. It's just me being lazy. You can create a quick container here and say, you know what, you go here. And don't mess with it, keep it separate. That's the ideal way to do things, by the way. 
and its own data store. The separate data store, separate MySQL database, that's how it should be done. In the example I'm going to show you, that is not how I have done by the way. It's just me being lazy. And lazy means this. That's what laziness to me in this example means. And I hope you understand what I mean by lazy. So that's what I'm doing. It needs a database. So I am going to give it a database. Which one? This one. So use the one I have up there. DB is called MySQL. Use this one. That one. Right? So that's how I, I was lazy in, uh, in, uh, is it Fox News? Yes. Hold on. Let's see. Did I confuse myself? No, I did not. So, yes, it's using the existing database from India Times, and that's okay as long as the customer is okay. So, having said uh, this piece, we understood. Let's move on. One more, a different product called Redmine. Redmine is another open source software. Redmine. It runs on Ruby on Rails. And it requires a different database, not your MySQL. So here is another container I want to run. I will use Redmine under the hood. It's a Ruby on Rails application, which expects a different database called PostgreSQL. And that is expected. So we need to worry about this and make sure that we provide it. So that's what I will be doing here is that this also needs a database called Postgres. And I will label this C4 something like, uh, for example, what I want to call it, some other magazine, like Time Magazine, for example, time.com. Yeah, just, just saying, Time Magazine is going to be Redmine based, whatever. Just remember that this is a Rails application and by convention, it exposes port number 3000 as opposed to port number 80, which is usual in most applications, 80. And everywhere else is 80 except Redmine is on port 3000. So we just have to expose it accordingly. And let's understand what it means. And so in the picture, I'll show you that. But here, as you look at this container, which will become our time.com container, this container uh, will expect Postgres. So we'll give it the library version of Postgres, which is available to us from this image. And we'll set a password and a user and construct this database that will be used by time.com. So with this described, let us go save this file, close it, go back here and here, and then call out a couple of di different critical elements. So let me erase a couple of things here to make room for what I want to write. And then describe to you the concept, which is, this one is what, what I choose time.com, time.com. Now the thing to remember is that this time.com is a Redmine application, so it exposes itself on port number 3000 on the container. This one is a Joomla maybe, so it exposes on port number 80. This is a WordPress, so it exposes on 80. This is also WordPress, the bad, bad WordPress, so it exposes on port number 80. This is a MySQL database. So it exposes itself on 3306. This is Postgres SQL database. So it exposes itself on what? I don't remember. So what do I do? I go here and say Postgres port. And there is the port number 45432. So that's the number 5432. That's the port that this Postgres container will expose the Postgres service at, at the container level. Now this guy is an Nginx reverse proxy. So it exposes itself on port number 80. And what I want to do now is to make sure that you understand the container mappings and port levels very, very clearly. So at the machine level, the only thing that actually is able to connect to any container directly is at port number 80 and is directly mapped like this. at port 80. 
So that's what you're looking at and dealing with. So you have to make sure that your reverse proxy understands that you know when there is a traffic asking for CNN.com, the traffic will arrive here. The traffic will get transported to the reverse proxy. And reverse proxy needs to know what is CNN.com and then appropriately communicate with this container and the container will then respond and the response back should go to this user who's asking for CNN. Another user comes along and asks for Time Magazine. So you say, you know, Time Magazine, please. And it'll also come on port number 80, which will reach here. And then this reverse proxy will know that this port 80 traffic needs to map to port number 3000. That's where Redmine is running. So that traffic will then reach this container because reverse proxy knows where the container is and which port it is running on. And then Redmine will kick off. It will respond back, maybe connect to the database at this port, respond back on port 3000, which will be mapped back to port 80 and rendered back to the machine level. And here you will see time.com. Like that. That's how the traffic should flow. And that's what you will expect to see as a result when I execute that. So let's go execute. So where is that? Here. So here is the compose file that we just saw. We have Nginx proxy, we have CNN, we have India Times, and we have Time Magazine, and what else we have? So four, four sites, right? Four examples, CNN, Time, India Times, and Fox News. Now, let me tell you one more thing. I don't control these website domains, so I need to do a hack. Oh, what do I do? I need to do a HC host hack for these exercises to actually make it useful and meaningful to you, I need to make a host file modification so that I can actually manipulate records for these domain names. Otherwise, without that, the exercise is futile. So I will go to the hack now. I hope you understand what I mean to say when I say I hack. What I'm really going to do is something like this. Edit my host file and then add like that and then I save now this means that I can ping time.com and it goes to local host and like that. So you understand the point. The point is that I made a local hack to my host file to make sure that these names resolve to the local machine. That's where my exercise is going to run. I hope you understand why I need to do that because I don't control these domains. I don't have any control over these guys. In fact, if you now open time.com or CNN or Fox News, you will see nothing, which is expected. You'll say time.com, show me what you got. It says problem loading unable to connect because it is attempting to connect to the local host machine. Same here, India times.com, unable to connect. Please tell me you understand this piece. That I just want to hear that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Okay. Is, is, good, good, good. Question, please. Is this because the 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 call is trying to resolve the local host first all the time, right? Correct. Uh, because I want to simulate that I am actually dealing with real websites, so that's my simulation, right here. Okay. That replaces the DNS lookup. Correct. Yep. yep. Yes. 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 Exactly. Uh, so I, since I don't control these sites, I, I have no way to manage them, manipulate them. So I'm just simulating it. By the way, this is a great idea to p play a prank on anybody that leaves their computer. Yeah, alone. but you know, <laughs> <laughs> you can play the prank if you root control them. But uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, pranks are okay. Yeah, totally okay. As long as you don't bother the people too much. Uh, hey, can we take a break before we actually execute anything? Okay, fine. So here we go, break.
Are you back? I'm back. Okay. So let's uh, check that you can still see my desktop. And I will proceed with actual running the exercise. Yep, we can see your desktop. Okay. So here we go. We are to run it. Run it is running it is simple. As simple as as simple as running Docker compose up. So let's go do it. So that's running it locally. Got it. And then, and then you're gonna run it on the machines. Yes, yes. Wow. Same exact thing there. Oh, there. Okay. Go ahead. Nope, you just answered my question. Yeah, same exact thing there. It's easy. The most difficult part here was to explain the every single piece and how it puts together in this picture. That's the most difficult part. Running it like one line, you know, it's actually trivial. But here we go. So that file, this file is the most important file which actually is used Every other file is kind of document to help you. And so we'll cat that file and make sure it is the right one. It has the time.com and all, all that. So it's the right one. Okay. Docker compose up dash D. So it'll do the whole thing and we just sit tight. So it is downloading the reverse proxy right now. What's the dash D for? Demon. Uh, background board, background board. <clears throat> up, up is to bring up the stack, and D is to put it in background. So I get my command line back to me. So I'm on command line control, and it is downloading the WordPress Tutum WordPress image, which is a all-inclusive WordPress database, data storage, everything, all in one bar, one container. That thing is getting pulled right now. It is getting pulled to this machine. And this pulling is the most uh, time consuming part. Uh, everything else is kind of very quick to bring it up. While this is doing it on this, let us go to the cloud machine that we have running. Can well, we this go brings up a good point. You're pulling down megabytes of hundreds of megabytes of data here. Is there any way to determine how much free disk space you're going to need to um, have available to uh, support yes. these files? Correct, yes, you can. You can ahead of time guess how much data storage is expected. And that is basically looking at the image file itself and all the images you will be using in your Docker Compose. 
and understanding how big those images are to begin with. So you'd have to do that manually. There's no command Correct. or Correct. tool to do that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Sounds like an opportunity. Yes. Yes. But you know, most Docker images are like hundreds of MBs, not that big, unless you're doing Windows Docker in which it's hundreds of gigabytes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Five to six GB sometimes. It's a large package in Windows, but in, in Linux, it is usually small. 100 GB is kind of pulling it. 200 is the max I have seen. Like most of these images, you can see at the end of the run, we'll see image sizes and we'll calculate the size. It will show you the list in Docker images command. It show you a list of all the machines and what the sizes are. And that you can just add up whatever you need to get an estimate of what you want to actually uh, reserve for storage allocation on the local system. That is different from your data storage requirements, which can be big or small depending on your size of your data. So it is downloading these images called Redmine, Postgres, and before that uh, Joomla, and before that Tutum WordPress, and it did not re-download the WordPress image because we already have it here in this machine. In a previous exercise we did, we already took care of that. So as a consequence of this run, it finished, by the way. And we now have a bunch of containers running. Let's go see what we have. So a bunch of them are running already. Let's go see Docker. Let me just shrink my font size a little bit. There we go. And Docker ps-a. Oh, what did I type? Docker ps-a. And now I have, so I can increase the font size a little bit. Yeah. So now you see Docker ps-a. This is an interesting screen to look at. The last line here is data container the container that stores data, which is this one. It just does its thing and then exits. It does nothing active. There's no process running. So it exited successfully. It is supposed to store data for the database, this guy. And so this container exposes port number 3306. Let's go see that container. Um, that is also 3306. And this is also 3306. Can you show me your Docker Compose I command? Will. Yes. Real quick. Yeah. <laughs> the Docker Compose command was this. Okay. I don't know. I'm having problems. Uh, <clears throat> what problem? Can you say the problem? Uh, it's, I don't know, it's not running. Uh, I'll keep looking at it. Okay, so we'll uh, revisit at the end of the session. We'll take a look at what you have. So uh, <clears throat> uh, right now, let's go see what this MySQL container is. And what it is doing is exposing its port 3306. You can see that right there. This port is exposed at the container level, which is this number, exposed. So anybody who wants to access can access. That is what this line is showing us. Next item that we look at in the picture is this container, India Times. Let's go see what it does. India Times is represented by this container, WordPress. If you now look at this container, it is exposing itself in port number 80. This is the India Times container. Uh, the other containers we have are CNN, which is this container. And it is a special container in that it exposes two ports. It has an HTTP server and a database server, both. So it is a all-inclusive setup. This contains WordPress, it contains MySQL, it also contains a storage for data, all these things together, which is a bad design. That's why you see two ports exposed right there. Next one is our time.com container, which is exposing port 3000 because it is actually Redmine, based on Redmine. So that's what you see here, 3000. It, it, there's this, there this Postgres container, which we have here, PG. And that container exposes 5432. And that is what Redmine will connect. So this time.com container will connect 
to this container because that's what is expected for the database. We'll see Fox News now. Uh, Fox News is here and it is running Joomla. It is exposing itself on port 80. Now let us see Docker images. And here we can see the size of images. So the biggest, fattest size is this one, which is the bad design. This is what you should not do, by the way. This is not how uh, images should be constructed. They should be split into smaller pieces that are logically separate from each other. Like we have here in this example, WordPress image. It is also kind of big. And the database image is also becoming growing big. Why? Why so much? It should not be that big, 409 MB. But maybe this is the latest image and we are using the 5.6. Okay, Redmine is over a half a gig. Yeah, Redmine is fat. So yeah. yeah. So just basically when you, when you so design your point. image. You've got, a, you've got like three gigs there. Correct. Three or four, three and a half Correct. gigs. Correct. Correct. So uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with these images, you most of the time, you use library images as you begin using Docker but you will soon evolve into creating your own images for yourself, for your own specific purposes. You will create a Docker file and then use that Docker file to construct an image that you push to your, your Docker repository, which is called a registry, by the way. So like Docker Hub is a registry and you can have your own registries like GCR is the Google registry, uh, which is available with Google, no, not this. GCR.io, I think it's GCR.io. So that is Google registry opening up, Google container registry. This is Docker Hub, which is Docker container registry. And you can set up your own registry. It, it, there is, by the way, a, a registry container, meaning you can actually run this container called registry to run your own registry. And it's the official image from Docker to run a registry. So you can run your own registry using this image if you want. There are others like Quay.io. Uh, Quay.io is another registry from CentOS. No, no, no. What's it, what's it? CoreOS, which is now acquired by Red Hat. So it's now part of Red Hat eventually. I think Red Hat acquired these guys like a few days ago. Quay and uh, uh, what is the company that? Yes. On the Postgres, you didn't have a data file or were you reusing the data container? Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm using storing data right here. I'm not calling it out. So oh, okay, so that's another out. bad design, right? Yeah, bad design, yes, yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm being lazy. So my, my goal with this exercise is to not run it like this in production, but to demonstrate a concept. That's the reason why I have these in, in a fashion that I have. Of course, I can keep extending, keep expanding, but Good catch. Yes, you're right. The data is sitting right there, which is a bad design. <clears throat> so Red Hat is acquired Core OS, and as a consequence, they get Quay as a registry. So these registries is where you store images. So like I, I use this official Docker Hub registry as my registry because I have an account there to keep up to five images private. So that's what I use. But you can use other places like this and Amazon also has and uh, you know, Azure also has and so all the big clouds have plus you have the ability to run your own registry using the registry image available in Docker. Okay. Quick, quick question. Yes. When I try to run the same example, I'm running into the authentication problems. Like in a local machine or? On local, in on local, local machine trying to pull, what is it? Trying to pull. Uh, I get the error registry, docker, j, wilder, nginx, proxy, manifest, latest, incorrect username and pa or password, unauthorized. Hmm. It's a public repository, so there is no reason to worry about authentication authorization because... This when, is I tr when I try to get it through the browser, I get the same JSON saying unauthorized. Okay, interesting. So try logging in. Here, but it should not even require. Let's go see doghub.docker.com. I will open up an incognito browser right now. So here we have Firefox, different browser where I'm not logged in. 
and in there i will open an incognito private window and in that private window i will paste jwilder and search for the proxy it should pop up i'm pretty sure it should pop up uh, jwilder and there it is in incognito window this is incognito you can see the blue or uh, orange whatever icon color is what color purple color and the proxy is available so it doesn't require authentication as such because it is public and open source however try it again if it still gives you problem i'll take a look it should work there is no reason for it to not work okay uh, moving on here images we saw we saw processes we saw that these things are running apparently. So there's port number 80, 80, 3000, 3306. We never go there directly ourselves because it's a database. The application is supposed to go there. We go to the port number 80, but not directly to the container. These are container ports. All these are container ports. Even this one. The only one that is not just a container port is this line entry, which is looking very different from every other line entry. As you saw before, this reads like this. Any traffic coming from anywhere on the port number 80 on the physical machine should be diverted towards port 80 on this container. That is what we will do now. So we'll go open localhost. Go and open localhost. What do you think we should see when I say localhost? You remember this picture here, right? Uh, this picture if i visit http localhost what do you think we should see Here. i can't remember what you mapped localhost to nothing i mapped to nothing yeah okay so it shouldn't do anything then correct no... it should show us nothing <laughs> yeah. so let's go see that nothing so where is that here yeah localhost and it shows us nothing because it doesn't know where to go and so the reverse proxy is, un it is actually showing us the reverse proxy right there. But it says, I don't know where to go now. I reach the reverse proxy, but what next? I don't know. So temporarily unavailable. That's the local host, which is not defined actually in the configuration. Now let us see India times. What do we have? So we get say, okay, refresh please. And so what do we get? We get WordPress and we can continue and we can finish, finish it off. And so how does the question is, how does the Nginx proxy detect new containers to reverse proxy? Do we have to read about this on JWilder's page? No, I will tell you right there. It is right here in this line. It is where it's looking at and monitoring the Docker socket. On the Docker socket, this is the environment variable that every container will have that exposes itself to the reverse proxy. Line number 26 in this case, and wait, it's not actually exposing itself to the doc, the, the reverse proxy. No, it just looks for the labels it's on exposing the containers. It's exposing itself to the Docker, the Docker platform. Here, let's, let me answer this. Let me, uh, let me answer this very succinctly. So let's go look at India times. Okay. Here is the container. So the number is four zero. I copy that number, that ID. I'll say Docker inspect and that container ID for India times. Okay, that's what I just did. I'm going to type it and Docker inspect and see what I see. So I see a bunch of dump. In the dump, I'll go and look for this environment variable. There is a item in there called virtual host, which labels itself. This label is what Docker knows about. When Nginx reverse proxy look for the Docker socket, it reads the environment variable value, virtual host India times, and then attempts to configure its own internal virtual host configuration. We'll take a look at a couple of other examples. Here is our Docker processes. We'll say now this time, instead of India times, let's go visit Fox News. So I'll grab this Joomla ID and Docker inspect and that ID for Joomla, for Fox News. And before I actually type that ID, let's go visit Fox News. So here is Fox News. 
and we expect to see Joomla. And here comes Joomla web installer. And you can finish the install, but that's not the point. The point is that it knows that you are dealing with Fox News because the Docker inspect command actually shows you one of the environmental flags right there, Fox News. And that is what JSON Builder Nginx proxy looks for in the environment for every running container. Is there a virtual host flag? Is there a label like that? And if so, I need to show it. And that's it's picking why. up the other containers. It's, it's, it knows that these containers exist by actually querying the container manager. Correct, Docker socket. On that socket. Okay, that was the glue that I wasn't really getting. Yeah, it, it's that right there. Yeah, here is the glue. That's the glue, okay. So it looks in the Docker socket, it inspects every Docker container, looks for the environment flag called virtual host, line 26, in this example line 37 in that example, each one of them represent that flag inside the environment for that particular container. And that's what this Docker socket will make it available to the Nginx reverse proxy, which will then modify its internal Nginx reverse proxy configuration on the runtime. Back here. <clears throat> we'll visit other sites also. So we saw Fox News, here we saw India Times, and here we have time.com. From a previous run, I'm going to refresh. And what do I see? I see red mine. Totally expected. Next one. I will now visit CNN. And what do I expect? WordPress. So here it is. It's coming up. And we can proceed. And we can finish it off. But that's not the point. So now, these processes that are running right now, you can go further and dig deeper into the Nginx JBuilder container, that one, go inside and inspect the Docker configuration, inspect the reverse proxy configuration if you like. You can do that for the exploration. I'll just guide you the direction to go for the exploration if you want, which is to look at the reverse proxy container, look at its identifier, copy the ID, copy the ID and say Docker exec IT and ID and bash. Now you're inside the Nginx container here. Here you can see that it is actually generating a template based configuration right there. We are now inside the reverse proxy container and let's go see what that container actually contains. And here is a template for Nginx reverse proxy. Here you can actually grab for a rather, I should say, VI. Oh, we are not found. <laughs> <laughs> that typically happens when containers are trying to be small and then they, they exclude items like VI, use for less. example. Use less. It's part of Ash, I believe. Less not found. So you will run into these problems. You have to actually install less of VI or any of these tools for you to be able to actually inspect. And you know, you don't typically do these things, but for, for curiosity, you can. You can, you know, go look for the file, look for how it actually is constructing. It is a fairly elaborate template but it is setting up virtual host on the fly like that for every known server that you have showing up on the runtime dynamically new containers pop up sometimes containers disappear and that is what you will see in this file so i'm exiting pro exiting from there looking at our exercise one more time here and i will now bring the stack down so docker compose down it shuts down all the containers cleanly. If you want to just go brute force, you can kill the, kill the whole thing. That's also okay. Now, having done this exercise here, it is trivially simple to do it there. How do you do that? You say uh, in that remote machine, whatever the IP address was. So you go back a step and say, what's the IP address here and here? And that's the IP, right? So let's go there and say ssh root at ip address so connected there now let's see what we have here docker files folder the docker files and then we have these files there same files that we saw locally are now available in that machine because we cloned it now i want to use the main example right you remember that's what we copied from here put that in here the other way to do the same thing is to not copy paste but instead just file rename so i will rename this file 
as uh, something and then rename the docker compose main examples file as docker compose.yaml now i have the correct file with the correct name this is now called something which was the docker compose yaml and the main examples now is called docker compose yaml now we will verify that and it is you know labeled as pg c4 c3 c2 so we don't have to rename them i don't want to edit this but you can edit if you like but it's immaterial what i would like to now do is just say docker compose up and dash d so let it build build the images pull it down all the images available and bring the whole stack up and all that good stuff but in the meanwhile what i will do is go to this machine and go to the terminal and uh, nano let's see host and in that machine which is my local computer what i would like to do is type the ip address of the remote machine out here this ip address so copy that paste it here and then type the names like the names i have are what c1 c2 c3 c1 c2 c3 c4 like that that's the name i chose so that's the name by default are available in that repository which is called if i remember right i think that's the name so in the main examples file we have names like c1 c2 then c3 and c4 representing cnn.com fox news india times time magazine four four servers right four machines four setups that's what i have now here c1 c2 c3 c4 pointing to the same remote ip address that i just have i saved it i'm going to save this file and then my host file looks like this which has this line which is operative line of my interest which means if i now open a browser on this machine and open http colon slash slash c1 what do you think i should see i should see wordpress provided this thing has finished but it is not so i have to wait for it and so it is doing the pulling the images and locally on that remote computer in this cloud somewhere and i have mapped this ip address as c1 c2 c3 c4 all these names so i'm waiting for this to finish and then i will visit c1 c2 c3 c4 and you can also visit c1 c2 c3 right now right with me as long as you are able to hack your etc host file in the remote computer or oh, sorry your computer not remote your computer if you are on windows you can also do this same thing even on windows except you have to manually edit this file with notepad if i hope i remember it right uh, notepad c colon slash ah hard to remember drivers at c host okay thank you <laughs> that's the file you will hack and you will need the escalation of privileges meaning you have to do administrator notepad and then you should be able to put an entry just like this and c1 c2 c3 in your in your notepad and save it and then you should see the same like i am going to see and i think i should now be ready to see because this thing as setup is finished so we should be able to see docker ps dash a and shows up the same exact setup like we saw before and uh we should now visit the browser in in macintosh um, for me here so i'll go say visit c1 please and that is c1 coming up going to show me wordpress right here and that is my c1 on the same box by the way c2 same box wordpress again this is india times
what tool shows you the git branches in your console on the mac okay uh, <laughs> you mean here right that's what you're asking yeah that tool is called yadder i'll, I'll talk about that briefly uh, it is a macintosh only thing by the way just so remember it's a mac only thing yet i think they are reporting it to linux it's happening but right now it is not so yadder is the name <coughs> uh, now here c1 you saw c2 saw you and let's go cc3 c3 that is your joomla and here is c4 and that is your redmine so it succeed it works i mean yeah okay i hope you understand what i mean by say it works because it worked it is supposed to work that's how we did this this is what we did it doesn't matter where you run it whether you run it on the box here on the virtual machine or you run it in the cloud or or any cloud for that matter any cloud as long as you have underlying container infrastructure you can get this reverse proxy to function just like the way you want and there are many other reverse proxies like this just like this so pause for questions before we switch because we how much time we have 30 minutes so we'll uh, we'll do something useful something meaningful but may not be able to finish that meaningful thing in the given amount of time we have but maybe we will maybe we will. i hope i will not run a fly because last time i was flying and i think you caught me flying you caught me uh, speeding i should say i was speeding i should not be speeding especially when it comes to minor fine fine details like this you know i i just zoom through which is not a good thing so stop me please please stop me and any time when i find that some things are not working i don't know why i have this habit of speeding up even faster <laughs> to make it, make it work and yes my machine was behaving improperly at that time and that somehow ticked me that hey why is it not working and then i speed up things and the cost of speeding up is what happened so i'm sorry about that so please when you catch me speeding please issue me a ticket thank you with this questions before we jump to the next level of complexity and uh, for the so question so i have i yeah so you're using docker compose here but that's how would you how would you use ansible in with this or is it are we talking about two very similar things two different tools about? put together to accomplish a goal so we okay. use ansible to prepare the foundation and okay. then we switched our tooling to say docker compose bring up my stack so we used ansible to bring the docker foundation okay then we switched our tooling we said now i'm going to configure uh using the docker compose method of bringing up ready made images so the docker compose commands that you created i did not create a command or, sorry not created you ran yes you could actually put that in the ansible file that then ansible would run on the yes. remote host yes 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 okay totally do that yes trying totally to, I'm, i'm trying to put all these pieces together beautiful to yes good question yes good question i am just doing it in step by step to make okay. people understand the tooling and then you can put them together yes totally right it is totally okay to mix and match any type of tool that you like as long as you can get it to work <laughs> and yeah, there are certain limitations you will find something don't work but that's the idea is to first of all understand the detail then you implement it step by step then you put pieces together to make it happen all in one shot and then you go on vacation <laughs> vacation to hawaii specifically so your yadder tool is right here if you are interested that's the tool called yadder it is fancy and yes it is quite of interesting it doesn't work on linux yet uh linux yeah linux ubuntu is not supported if it works great but if it doesn't please don't complain that's what they're saying what is yadder so you may install blah 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 so yeah these are esoteric uh tools that i seem to like that's the tool it is called y a d r yet another dot file repo <clears throat> yeah 
it also comes with much more fancy things that you don't visually see but i use them all the time you, you may not notice them but uh, they are in my fingertips and so that's that's what i you you may not see them because they're they're not visual but they are doing it the thing is doing it for me uh which is my customization the way exactly the way i want is what i have used in that tool to make it happen so yarder is one of them this hammer spoon was another one and some bunch of other fancy things i modify sometimes so i'm assuming that you don't have any further questions on this thing that we just ran in two different places where is the design here this any questions on this before we change no questions okay now let's make complexity even greater what i want to do now is uh, or uh, maybe maybe i, I think uh, in the time we have i don't think we can handle that next level of detail so let's go here and do some more exercises with the machine that we have at hand i think that's a better use of time so back to one step back to this one and then open atom editor and i'll these are simpler exercises so it's a whole lot easier to to see and what i want to do is uh in in that exercise that we have in that remote machine here we are connected to that machine out there so we'll say docker compose down bring the whole stack down the complete stack that stack goes away and with this gone i would like to do some slightly simpler exercises on the same box because the time we have is only 30 minutes i don't think i can actually begin uh, the next exercise to make a three machine cluster using ansible first and then understand how do we then go to the reverse proxy business and complicate our setup without making it complex it will be complicated but from a, from an understanding usage deployment it will be very very reasonable from a from that perspective so yes it will become complex because layers will increase and machines will increase and containers will increase and all that but you get to understand what we are really trying to accomplish which is what i attempt to do in this exercise or in this in this boot camp so our our docker ps should show nothing and now we have that machine which is able to run docker we have some images there so it will not be thrown away we can reuse these images and that is what i intend to do so in this command line for macintosh i don't want to use that one right now what i intend to do is to show you how to build components step by step one piece at a time so if you don't have such a complex design ready given to you how do you begin running simple things like a simple application you have in mind and you want to run those things step by step so if you want to just start the nginx proxy here is what you need to do let's go see that thing what it actually does so let's go understand what that thing will do for us if you don't use the docker compose methods which are you know a complex method of collecting and handling a large design that we just saw and implemented and ran what if you just want to stand up only the reverse proxy right now so here we have this is a four line command it is mapping port number 80 on the machine to port number 80 in the container so machine to container and mapping the docker socket just like that and using the nginx jbuilder proxy image so copy that command run it here and boom we have a container ready what do we have one container what is it how does it run it maps any traffic from the outside coming on port 80 on the machine to port number 80 at the container level that's exactly what we wanted so we have a reverse proxy there right, right now if you now visit that machine and say go to c1 so not h1 but c1 it will say temporarily unavailable because this nginx reverse proxy is running and it is showing us that it doesn't know where to go when you type c1 because there is nothing actually called out like that by name now i will run some application inside if i have some application in mind a simple application like you know that just tells 
who it is or who am I is the machine is the image that I want to run. And so what I want to do is run this JSON builder who am I image. It is another simple image that is going to run in this fashion. What I will do is name it as who am I and assign a virtual host, say foo.bar.com. That's the name I choose. Just like India Times, CNN.com, foobar. And invoke this who am I image like that. So it is unable to find that image locally, so it will pull it down. It's a small image, so it should finish up quickly. And it runs. What do we have there? Let's go see that, docker ps-a. So we have two containers up and running right now. And those two, let's go see them again. Those two are uh, the who am I container which is basically a web server and it is exposing itself on port 8000. So this Nginx JWilder proxy container when, when it sees a traffic coming from the outside on port 80, it will get connected to the port number 80 on the JSON builder Nginx proxy container and then Nginx proxy will divert that traffic provided the person who is visiting is asking for foobar or foo.bar.com by name. If you ask it by name, you will get diverted to port 8000 on the who am I container. So let's go see that. If you are able to run this command, sorry, uh, just simply curl foo.bar.com, there is no such thing to go. So the DNS system doesn't know what this foobar is, so it fails. I cannot resolve it which is expected because foo.bar.com is not a real site. However, we can simulate that in curl and say that, you know what, pretend that I want you to be called as foo.bar.com and I want you to attempt to connect to the box you are running on, the local host, the machine, the remote machine we have in Vulture Cloud right there. So it says, I am that ID. And what is that ID? Is the container ID right there. It just exposes the ID itself. That's the application as simple as saying, hey, I'm that ID running, who am I? It just tells you the name of the container running, the container ID there. That shows up. Now, if you want to actually visit this foobar site on a browser and see the local host, you need to do a DNS hack. You can do that DNS hack simply by going to a real machine. And in there, we'll say sudo nano, and here we'll type the name foobar or other food.bar.com at the very end and save and close. Now our browser should be able to successfully open foo.bar.com. And here we should see I am that ID. The same ID that you know should show, which is what this ID is, is what is showing up when you visit the browser on that IP address for this machine, which is late for dinner. That's one example. Now we'll expand this again further uh, without doing the Docker compose way, but doing it the manual way, the step-by-step -step way. The step-by-step -step way involves manually running WordPress, which means first thing you need to have a method a systematic method to construct a network. A, think of it as an overlay network like we discussed before. So let's go, first of all, kill this who am I container. And I will describe the idea of creating a container network. So let me kill this, kill these two guys first, both of them, docker rm-f. So both the containers dead and we have nothing running. Nice. Now let us see docker network LS, how many networks do we currently have in the Docker system? We have a bridge network, we have a host network, and a null none network. This is not really a network. So bridge and host, two networks available. They're given to you by default. What I want to now do is actually map 
to create a separate network for use by our WordPress application that I will be now manually adding without using the help of Docker Compose. That may be a case in which you want to manually modify certain aspects of certain applications running. So that the other approach that I'm showing you right now is, is uh, what I'm dealing with is I need to first of all create a network. So we will create a network like this. And it does. That's all it takes to create a network. Now we have a network. It is called CG, Cloud Genius Network Available. This network ID. I will use that network ID available in our subsequent steps, like right here. I would like to make sure that my Nginx reverse proxy is constructed on that network. So it has a foot on that network. So that's the command to invoke. Pretty similar to the previous time, except we are calling out that you should please use this network called CG, the one I created, the Cloud Genius Network. And on that network, you please look for Docker socket for a label called virtual host for any new coming container. So I'll start this container and it starts and runs. It's run the same way like we know before. So the port number 80 on the machine mapped to port number 80 at the container level. So we have that taken care of. Next, what I want to do is, <clears throat> next what I want to do is uh, to create a different modality of storing data. Like you, in the previous example you saw, I create a container and then let it exit. And then I use that container's dead body to store data. That's the older way of doing things. In recent versions of Docker, there is a concept of a Docker volume. So here is the concept, Docker volume. These are the volumes already available in Docker, currently in use. I can create one other volume right now. What I want to do is to create a volume to store my DB data. So here it is. And now I have a place to store data. And it shows up right there. And it is local, meaning it is sitting on that remote vulture machine. You saw that, oh, I created again by mistake, but that doesn't hurt. It doesn't actually duplicate the data, but it is the local location, which is basically a file system allocation for use to store the database data is what I just did using the volume command, volume create command. And that, that volume is what I will now use as opposed to a separate container in the last exercise. Where does const- that volumes data actually be, is it actually stored on the local disk someplace? Yeah, it is sitting right here. You got that? Is that a directory or is that? Yeah, varlib docker volumes. Okay. So if you wanted to, if you're saving data there and you wanted to back that data up or. You back up this folder, db data. Back up the folder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you should not handle it like. (laughs) <laughs> there, there are better ways to handle data. And so like copying data like this is not recommended. So I know where it is stored, but don't do it that way. There is a proper way to back up and restore Docker volumes. That's what you should use. There is a Docker restore command and Docker backup command that you should use with volumes and don't manually copy these files and folders like that. That's not recommended. Oh okay, yeah, that's good to know. Thanks. Okay. So we'll come out of that folder. Don't go there (laughs) unnecessarily. Of course you can go, but there is no need to go there. Now here, what we are dealing with is uh, that that JSON builder currently running Nginx proxy. And I have a Docker volume ready. Uh, Docker volume LS will show us the volume that I want. I'm interested in that volume. I'm going to use that volume now to create a database. So here's the, here is the construction of that container in which I'm using the MySQL image and I'm using the data, con- data volume right there, DB data, line 36, and mapping it to the varlib MySQL where my database actually sits inside. I'm allocating some passwords and some usernames and things like that. These are necessary for use with WordPress, so you just call them out. You can choose your name and password if you like. 
but that's besides the point. Next one, what I want to do is label this as, uh, sorry, let, let's, go, let's go run the database container here. So here, this container, you can copy that and run it on the command line, pretty much like this. However, there is something I want you to know, that some people don't like the fact that this MySQL is owned by Oracle. So what those people have done is they have constructed <coughs> this thing. It is called MariaDB. It is also open source, but it is a replacement for MySQL. And many people actually use this. It is totally fine to use this. Actually, people in the open source prefer to use this over MySQL. Having said, if you go to Docker Hub. Was that a branch, a fork no, off of No, the it's, a, it's a rewrite. It's a rewrite for it's license rewrite. purposes. It's a rewrite for license purposes. So, is so, it, so the problem is, is uh, the question is, is can you use the mice if your application at the application level is using MySQL, SQL commands and, and functionality, is MariaDB just a replacement? Or is there, do you have to make changes in your data, in your application to use? No them? change whatsoever. Okay. So, so what, what change you will do is I'll do the change for you right now. I'll tell you what changes need to happen. The only change you will do is this change right here. Instead of MySQL 5.7, you say Maria. That's it. That's so all, all you need. the clients SQL SQL Every single thing is available. The same thing. Every single thing is available except this one image. You use the MariaDB image. There, that's the only change. What about the var lib MySQL? For Everything this? is the same. Okay. So let's go do that. Let's go do it this way, right? We'll use MariaDB instead of MySQL just to demonstrate the point. So this is MySQL. I'm breaking it, not running it. I'm running MariaDB. No other change. Run it. So it runs. Let it run. In the meanwhile, we talk about next step. So here, next idea is to run an application called WordPress. And the virtual host I want to actually use is foobar, not this name. So we'll call it foo.bar.com. Just change it. It uses the database, MariaDB. Same port, same everything, no change. And with that understood, what I would like to make sure that I do here is the username is matching the database user. So the MySQL username, I've chosen username there. So I'll copy that and put that same user here. And the password I chose was password. So I copy that and put the same password here. That is something I need to change. And then I save it. And then I copy this setup. It is going to create another container, by the way, with WordPress and connect it on the same network called Cloud Genius and hook it up with the database that I have in mind right there. Now, that's what you will see when I run, run this command. We'll start a WordPress container on the same network that we have created for us, which is the CG network. Let's go first of all, see what containers do we have running. We have <clears throat> this MariaDB which is actually MySQL for most practical purposes, exposing itself on port 3306. Okay, now run WordPress. So it runs. It is going to pull down and run it. So let's see what we have running now. We have WordPress running up for four seconds at port 80 on the container called app. We have MariaDB running at this port called DB. And we have our Nginx proxy also running at port 80 and map to the machine port 80. And this thing is called foobar, or foo.bar.com. So that ID, container ID, if you go and inspect, you will find that it contains an environment reference right there called virtual host, foo.bar.com. The host, the username, the password, they are all inside in the Docker inspect command, which is how the container got generated. This is the WordPress container we are talking about. 
this container. We were looking at this container. So now our thing should be already functional, by the way, on foo.bar.com in this location. We currently have this thing from a previous run. We just refresh the page and we see WordPress. And we continue. And we are already configured with our login and username and password, so we just finish it off. And here, as you can see, we are logged in successfully. The database connection is all working. I did not change anything except the fact that I used MariaDB. And it is our WordPress, functional. You can go back and still use MySQL if you like. Just rename that to MySQL, save it. Go here, kill your MariaDB container. And then run MySQL with the same credential, same username, password, everything. And off it goes. It doesn't find the MySQL database locally, image locally, because it was 5.7. And now I'm looking at latest. So I should have typed my 5.7 here to make it faster, but it's only a few seconds. So it should function now. Now let us see what we have. It is functional. Now let's go test back here on foo.bar.com. What do we have here? Let's go log out. And it logged out. Let's go log in. And it logged in. I changed the entire database engine at the back end. Do you see that? And it preserved the data. That's the kind of compatibility I'm talking about. It preserved the data. Yeah, I did not have to set up again because we had a using a volume. That volume stored our data from the first setup and it was kept intact because we are reusing the volume right here in line number 36. So these are the commands that I ran. I ran them manually and I would like you to have them. So I'm gonna copy them for you. So here is Slack chat coming up. That's the first thing I think I did, followed by this snippet. Oh, there was one more thing I did before this. So let me get that piece before. The one thing I did was this. <clears throat> so followed by that snippet to create Nginx, uh, sorry, uh, reverse proxy in place. And then subsequent to that, <coughs> I ran this step first with MariaDB and then with modified it on the, on the fly to MySQL. And it still worked with our data intact. So it is basically substitutable. So you have these guys, uh, is these snippets available with you. If, you. if you want to use them, you can. They're in Slack chat. And let me save this. So questions on this? I, th that I think will, uh, was, was the, in the time available to us, uh, that was the portion I was able to fit in. Uh, but uh, the, the next time, but what I would like to start with is to expand our discussion into a multi-machine setup. So at the foundation, this red ink that you see, red color ink, this one, uh, we will make three of them and eventually a generalized number n n number of uh, machines we'll generalize generalize it also uh, we'll use the ansible will we'll, by the way building this foundation requires tooling which will use ansible tooling in first demonstration in the second demonstration we'll uh, at some point we'll use and you know, terraform uh, ways of doing the same thing and you will see some differences in the two approaches. So uh, with that, I would like to pause recording and next time we will 
begin creating a setup like this, three boxes, and have some kind of a proxy manage setup for us in, in that kind of a scalable setup. And these three boxes will run containers here, more containers here, and we'll, we'll be able to see this visually also. So you will not uh, you know, find a hard time understanding what's going on because this kind of a process of looking at a command line to find out what container is running is not the best way to demonstrate. So we have a visual tool that uh, we are going to use and uh, we'll uh, do that next time, which is when we are meeting. Nilesh, are you saying you're going to balance something across three or it's going to be running three separate um, applications completely different? No, we'll have, we'll, we'll, let me describe. I think okay. I, I did not describe. So let's go see. If you have a, an application running, say, A here, and that needs to scale out. So it will scale out in multiple containers. Now you can have a setup in which you can have uh, three boxes uh, running containers A, another copy of A, another copy of A here, and if you need more, A here. So it automatically goes. So if you want just three copies, what will happen is this. If you want fourth copy, you get this. Fifth copy, sixth copy, seventh copy, that's how it automatically does for you. It will automatically balance the load across three machines. All you need to do is specify how many of these guys you want. Okay. All right. Now I see what you're driving at. Okay. Okay. So that's what we'll do. Uh, I mean, this is what one of the demonstrations we will see live in uh, next time, which is 19th. And uh, then we switch topics on 21st. I think we are switching to architecture. So it will be a, a, a slight change and I will, uh, you will discuss at that time as to what I, what I, I do want to cover some of the conceptual uh, topics in architecture and I'll give you some flexibility to pick and choose what you want to cover because we will have only nine more sessions like this starting from next time. So today is, uh, where is that? So if you look at nine more sessions, so including today, there are 10. So we have eight of cloud architecture and then two including today, which is remaining nine sessions. And uh, so we'll, we'll uh, you know, keep some flexibility as to what you want us to cover versus what you want us to skip. I will give you a menu, you pick and choose. That's how I think I will handle. I hope uh, you, if you don't pick and choose on the menu, I will choose my menu <laughs> and I will pick items from the menu but I'll let you choose and, and let you decide what you want us to cover this versus that because you know, tastes and preferences differ. There are way more, way much more content that I have in terms of live examples that you will be able to run. The only challenge we have with these recent iterations of open source projects is that they are not written down black and white for us to go do exercises except in Git repositories or snippets like this. So that's why it is a little bit hard to, to, to keep track of what we are covering and I understand. But what I'm trying to do is something that you may have noted is what I do is I go to the videos that I store and I at least give you a link to the repositories that I've been using. So in the DevOps segment, you go back down to the videos here. At the end of every video, you will find what I describe is what I cover for the last time I said in that day on the 14th, I did these three or four different exercises and they have GitHub links, so you can actually read them. And I want to go cover similar things for today and subsequent days and we'll, we'll, we'll do these most of these times on GitHub and with some Git repositories as I prepare them. Uh, sometimes they are really, really like prepared two days in advance or sometimes the same day that I, uh, I come up with exercises that, are, that I see and I find new things and I pick up shiny objects as you may have seen by now. So with that, I will uh, pause the recording and listen for questions.